started a group called San Clemente Green and the purpose was to create a sustainability action plan because we had heard about Pasadena doing the same thing and we thought, well, why, why can't our city do that? And then we found out, well, the city council needs to be approached and then they have to allocate resources to it, so you better get a community group together and, and make your points known. And we did that and we've never done anything like that before, so I guess a big part of this story really for me is that anyone with no experience at all in things like this can get involved and make more of a difference than you might realize. One time we went to an NRC meeting and out of the blue these two whistleblowers stood up in the crowd and challenged the NRC and Edison in front of everyone and said, you know, as much as we love this company and our fellow workers and everything, you're just not operating safely and you're not following protocol and these were managers of the welding department. And they'd they, worked there for 25 or 30 years. Yeah, they had a lot on the line to stand up and be so bold like that. And they were challenging the system for the way they were welding the dry cask storage together. And it wasn't per code and they're taking shortcuts. And Anyway, I was so impressed. We were just amazed because up till now it's all been hearsay and no one really ever spoke out in public about mm -hmm. some of these rumors going on around safety issues. And I was so impressed, the next article I wrote was about how heroic these guys were to come out and talk to the public and confront the authority the way they did. After writing that article, uh, I started getting emails from people that were afraid to come out in the public, but they wanted to tell us stuff if we would protect their identity. These and are other employees. Yeah, the people that were working there currently. So we were yeah, really appreciative that they would take that step. And I told them, I'll protect your identity, but we want this to get to the NRC. And they said, that's the whole point. They want the public to be protected from, uh, from bad practices at the plant. We're really actually very well embraced by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They said, it's great you're doing this service and it's kind of like your civic duty to tell us about this stuff. But then what we pointed out to them was critical information. One of the first whistleblowers was saying, this is during the period when they're installing the brand new steam generators about two years ago, at the end of 2009, early 2010. They're telling us how uh, they're behind schedule, they got behind because they had to repair some of the generators on site, uh, way, way over budget, so they're starting to cut testing and some of the procedures that would take longer. One, one particular procedure was called hot functional testing and it's, it's usually, it's a way to test the system before they introduce radioactive elements and they can bring it up the same pressure, same temperatures, and simulate operating full condition, full capacity, but it takes you know another month almost to bring it up to the speed and bring it down and test things. So the company wasn't willing to do that. The reasons they were saying is that that hot functional testing is only appropriate for brand new nuclear facilities that haven't been tested before. And we're saying, well, this is like brand new and we never anticipated replacing the generators to begin with. That was, uh, that was supposed to be life, lifetime of the plant. So the, instead they have to cut holes through the domes and retract the generators and put them back in. So the, the shell has been compromised in the process. And now we have generators that are fully radiated and leaking and we have no recourse. It could have all been avoided if they had just listened to the whistleblowers. But others continue to talk to us about um, the, the fear of retaliation and uh, the anxiety of living under those kind of pressures and you don't know who you can trust, who you can talk to. And there's real ongoing issues with um, even just industrial accidents that could happen. Big fans that are let uncovered and wiring that's improper or circuit breakers that are not the right uh, sensitivity so even under 
a lot of pressure, they won't trigger and they'll just burn up the wires. I mean, these are things that have been complained about for years, 10, 12 years, and still nothing being done about this. We're grateful people will talk to us. I just wish more people would listen to us. When you go to city councils and they say we're fear mongers and we're, we're inexperienced, we don't know what we're talking about, we're just overreacting basically. And then people really took an interest in what we had to say when Fukushima took place. Even then, it was an uphill battle. You know, we only had one, one we on had the, city the mayor kind of listening yeah. to us. The other four were pretty much yeah. shooting us down. For the, well, we, eventually, they did come around. Yeah, and I think the difference was instead of listening to Joe Schmo and the public, uh, we actually got Arnie Gunderson and. Uh, Dan Hirsch. Dan Hirsch. Dan Hirsch came here in person. Arnie was here through video, Skype, and uh, Helen Caldicott weighed in. And we had a public hearing of about 300 people showed up in an official city-ordained process. So after hearing Edison, they did that in a separate meeting because, of course, we couldn't have a dialogue at the same time. There might be confrontation or something. But, uh, so we got two separate meetings, and after the second meeting, the city council voted unanimously to call for everything just short of immediate decommissioning. We have about 1,400 tons of spent fuel, highly radioactive, the worst kind of fuel because it sits in our reactors extra long, and it's just sitting in pools. They have some of it in dry cast storage, but it's quadruple the amount of storage in these pools beyond what it was designed for and they have nowhere to put it so they just keep making it so we're really proud of our city council to take that step and recognize those kind of issues now we have Laguna Beach on a similar path to what San Clemente did with very strong language about concerns we sh we all share and then that was followed by Irvine and then Solana Beach so we have Probably 25 more high priority cities we want to hit in the next probably two months and build on our momentum and try to try to carry this thing further and get the same kind of response. It's been four to one in two of the cities and the other two were unanimous. So it's pretty uh, encouraging that maybe our message will get out to the community and we'll know that this is something we just don't need to tolerate. You know, uh, the, the lies that we've been told, the misrepresentations. Uh, I just want to make the point again about our tsunami wall, because that is not just a short wall. This is what they call a 30-foot tsunami wall. You see out here where the tide usually comes up, all the sand is from wave action bringing it over the top of the wall. It's short on credibility when you talk about Edison and the NRC all standing firmly behind this claim that it's 30 feet tall. It just makes you wonder what other kind of misleading information they're giving us. You know, I can go down here and measure it with a tape measure and say, you guys are misleading us. But I can't say that about how much spent fuel there is or how secure those uh, steam generators are. You know, we have to rely on them providing us information. That's, that's a big part of our message to the cities is we're demanding that we have access to the investigation reports and have people like Arnie Gunderson confirm or, or you know, contest some of these findings. And until we have the facts, we're just hoping that they'll be looking out for us and doing the right thing. Very disconcerting when they say, first of all, there's been no radiation released. Don't worry. And then it's, well, the next day, maybe a little bit of radiation. And then it, it was measurable, but not enough that the public has to be worried about it. And we have no way of knowing. That's why we did the thing with the radiation monitoring with the public, because we can't trust the authorities that up till now, we always thought, well, someone's covering it, they're looking out for us, we can worry about paying our bills and watching out for our children. And, and planting a garden or something. <laughs> but now we're on full alert. We're like, no way are we trusting anything they say. We want verification and uh, they know they better be on their toes too.
the NRC and Edison, they're going through the motions, acting like public safety comes first, but they're actually considering starting these steam generators that have an internal design flaw that can't be fixed by plugging tubes. And they're proposing that, well, we'll just do one reactor with two steam generators, run it up to where it starts to vibrate again, bring it down a little bit. And, you know, if these tubes fail, they caught one tube leaking small, like a pinhole leak. But within 24 hours, that could have cut through the tube, started rattling around and destroying the other tubes. And cascading effect would have released huge amounts of radiation uncontrollably into the environment. And it would deprive the reactors of water. Then, so if the backup systems for the reactors failed, then we would have been faced with a meltdown, worse than Fukushima. And yet they just tell the public, oh, it's nothing to worry about. We're going to test it again, see what happens. It's so wrong. No restarting, no matter <laughs> no. what. So, that's our story, and we're sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs>